The gaming industry is going through a restructuring phase with massive layoffs and studio closures. And while some of them are necessary for a studio's or company's longevity, most of them aren't. I aim to cut through the corporate PR talk and expose the darker realities and uncomfortable truths of the gaming industry. Today, we will explore the layoffs, studio closures, future plans, and highlight the stark contradictions and deceptions at the core of the industry's biggest players, who relentlessly prioritize short-term profits over innovation, creativity, and employment. Brace yourselves, it's going to be a bumpy ride. As many of you know, Microsoft has recently closed a number of Bethesda studios. One of those studios was Arkane Austin. Over the years, Arkane Studios had cultivated a reputation of releasing games that are beloved by fans such as Prey and Dishonored 2. Unfortunately, those games, although very good, never made stellar sales. You see, immersive sim games don't appeal to a large audience. This specialization was the main issue why the studio's most recent game, Redfall, managed to be at once a commercial and critical disappointment. Redfall is a multiplayer shooter set on a fictional Massachusetts island full of vampires that was released on May 2nd, 2023. The game had issues in every aspect of its design. Redfall was an unpolished, half-baked, underwhelming and awkward game. As a result, it received a very poor reception with fans and critics highlighting the game's bugs and shortcomings. On the review aggregation website Metacritic, Redfall has earned a meager 54 out of 100, ranking it among 2023's worst-reviewed games. Its score sits today at 56 out of 100. Redfall's underwhelming financial performance was another pain point that year for Microsoft's Xbox division, which has struggled to produce hits and watched as its planned $69 billion acquisition of Activision Blizzard got delayed by US and UK regulators. Joost van Joinen, a video game analyst and professor, said Redfall's failure highlights the significant gap between Microsoft's lofty aspirations and its actual products, which also calls into question Microsoft's ability to establish long-term franchises on its own strength rather than buying them outright. In an interview with a YouTube channel Kinda Funny Games, Xbox boss Phil Spencer said that Redfall's review scores were significantly lower than our internal metrics suggesting the lackluster debut may have caught the company off guard, which couldn't be further from the truth. According to Bloomberg, Arkane Austin was not surprised by Redfall's mediocre reception. The project was plagued by unclear direction, frequent attrition, and chronic understaffing, as reported by over a dozen employees who worked on the game, speaking anonymously since they were not authorized to speak publicly. It is 2018 and at the time, Zenimax, the parent company of Bethesda Softworks, was looking for a buyer. It is the post-Overwatch and Fortnite era and everyone is looking to create the next successful live service game in the games-as-a-service race. Zenimax was no different. Behind the scenes, the company was encouraging its studios to develop games that would incorporate microtransactions. Although this wasn't an absolute mandate, Several Zenimax franchises such as Doom and Wolfenstein would soon release new games incorporating online multiplayer and monetization options, as shown by the leaked Xbox Game Studios documents, with Elder Scrolls Online and Fallout 76 leading the charge. Following the commercially unsuccessful release of its sci-fi shooter Prey in 2022, leadership across Zenimax wanted Arkane Austin to develop a game that would appeal to a broader audience and include monetization options. Thus, Redfall was born. Harvey Smith and Ricardo Bear, respected industry veterans both, who worked on the Deus Ex franchise, Dishonored and other Arcane games, were tasked to serve as core directors of this new Arcane Austin game. Since its foundation in 1999, Arcane has become renowned for its immersive sims, single-player games that blend character building with multiple ways to overcome obstacles, from combat to stealth and usually using unique game mechanics. Over the years, the studio has perfected this formula, earning a legendary reputation for its mechanics, game and level designs. Initially, Redfall was introduced to the staff as a multiplayer arcane game with microtransactions, a concept that many team members found confusing, as they revealed in later interviews. This confusion was understandable given the studio's history. 
Whether Arcane's immersive sim expertise would translate well in a multiplayer environment with microtransactions, no less, was an open question. Developers under Smith and Bear said the two leads were excited about taking on this challenge, but as the project progressed, they failed to provide clear direction. According to Bloomberg, staff members expressed growing frustration over time due to the management's frequent design changes in referencing other games like Far Cry and Borderlands. This inconsistency led to confusion across various departments with each having different perceptions of the game's direction. Moreover, a persistent underlying tension between single-player and multiplayer design elements remained unresolved throughout the development process. At the time, Arkane, both uh, Lyon and Austin Studios, was chronically understaffed. Arkane Austin, with fewer than 100 employees, was adequately staffed for a single-player game like Prey, but insufficient for a multiplayer game intended to compete with giants like Fortnite, Destiny, The Division and others, which are usually developed by teams of hundreds. Reports indicate that even with extra support from Zenimax's Wisconsin-based Roundhouse Studios and other outsourcing firms, Arkane Austin still faced significant challenges in developing the game. As a result, morale at Arkane Austin suffered. From the start, a lot of Arkane Austin's veterans were not interested in developing a multiplayer game and with Redfall entering development hell, they left in droves. According to a Bloomberg analysis of LinkedIn and Prey's credits, during Redfall's development, roughly 70% of Arkane Austin who had worked on Prey would no longer be at the studio. The Arkane Austin that developed Dishonored 2 and Prey was essentially no more. With Zenimax having a reputation of paying lower than average salaries, filling those vacancies became a challenge. Being located in Texas didn't help either, as a lot of progressive video game developers weren't willing to relocate to Texas due to the state's conservative social policies. Zenimax was looking to hire people with experience on multiplayer shooters. But with Redfall being an unannounced project and Arkane Austin having a reputation for high-quality single-player immersive sims, it was no surprise that they attracted mostly people who were, by and large, looking to work on a single-player immersive sim game. As of September 21, 2020, Redfall has been under development for nearly three years when Microsoft acquired Zenimax for $7.5 billion. This purchase added franchises such as Doom, The Elder Scrolls and Fallout to Xbox's portfolio, along with a then-upcoming Starfield. Within this acquisition, Arkane's portfolio, including Redfall, although not a priority, was considered a valuable addition for Microsoft, particularly if Redfall became a hit. Arkane Austin, who didn't want to develop Redfall, hoped that Microsoft might cancel Redfall or, better yet, let them reboot it as a single-player game. Instead, Microsoft, aside from cancelling a version of Redfall that had been planned for the PlayStation 5, insisted on Redfall's development and allowed Zenimax to continue operating as it had before, which meant that Redfall's development hell would continue. However, Xbox, particularly under Phil Spencer's direction, significantly amplified the hype for Redfall. During the Xbox and Bethesda game showcase of 2021, Xbox showcased Redfall as a vampire extravaganza from its acclaimed Arcane Studio and as one of its major upcoming releases, alongside Starfield. The game was even given the prestigious finale spot, positioning it as a highlight of Xbox's future lineup. Before I go, there's one more thing. Take a look at this brand new, original game from the Arcane team at Bethesda the studio that created Prey and Dishonored. Arcane created something new for them, an open world immersive shooter that you can play alone or with your friends. And like Starfield, this game will be an Xbox exclusive. Despite being at the final stages of Redfall's development, Arcane Austin was still understaffed. With the team being stretched thin during this crucial stage, release dates were repeatedly delayed, moving from Halloween 2022 to early 2023 and finally to May 2nd, 2023. Throughout this period, Smith and other leaders reassured the team that the game would improve significantly once the final artwork was added and bugs were resolved, invoking the arcane magic that had enhanced previous titles. However, this time, 
70% of the talent responsible for said arcane magic had already left the studio. The rest, as they say, is history. The final game was glitchy, with a locked 30fps, a bland setting and story, poor enemy AI, and an awkward mix between single player and multiplayer ideas that didn't really mix well. Eurogamer had an interview with Harvey Smith post-release where he said that early on he pushed back against the obligatory inclusion of an in-game store. But that was not what Zenimax had in mind. For the first three years of development, Redfall did have that in-game store in place. But as time went on, players were getting tired of games as a service, and in 2021, Arcane finally scrapped its monetization plans. In that same interview and reflecting on his life back at Arcane Austin in Texas, Smith says, Twice on this project, Austin has lost power and water. We had no power for 10 days and had to boil our water. Another time recently, we lost power for 4 days. Microsoft's Phil Spencer would later go on record in the kinda funny podcast interview saying that Xbox didn't do a good job early in engaging Arcane Austin and also took responsibility for at least the game's technical failures. Despite Redfall's failure, Microsoft was not planning to shut Arcane Austin. That was according to Xbox Game Studios boss Matt Booty in June 2023. According to IGN, the now abandoned Redfall had a roadmap of support that was being actively worked on before Microsoft scrapped all development and closed its developer. Arcane Austin was working on a DLC and updates for the game with the expectation they would release until very recently as well as a patch to make the game playable offline. Instead, Arcane Austin paid the price of bad management, corporate greed, false assurances and Microsoft's desperation to beat Sony and Nintendo at their own game. Arcane Austin's closure also reflects a troubling scenario of a short-sighted and unethical Xbox leadership failing to grasp Arcane Austin's history and importance as a studio. Tango Gameworks may sound unfamiliar to most people, but it had an iconic figure of the gaming industry at its helm. Tango Gameworks was a Japanese video game developer based in Tokyo, founded in March 2010 by Shinji Mikami. If you don't know who Shinji Mikami is, then allow me to tell you about him in this short summary. Shinji Mikami was a director of the first Resident Evil game way back in 1996. He was a leading figure at Capcom for many years and has also worked at Clover Studio and Platinum Games until he founded Tango Gameworks in 2010 where he stayed until 2023. Some of his most notable works as a director include Resident Evil, Dino Crisis, PN03, short for product number 3, Resident Evil 4, where he was also the writer of the game, God Hand, Vanquish, and The Evil Within. Tango Gameworks became Microsoft's first development studio based in Japan after the Zenimax acquisition and developed the following games. The Evil Within, The Evil Within 2, Ghostwire Tokyo, Hero Dice, and Hi-Fi Rush. The Evil Within and The Evil Within 2, although good horror games, were not considered financial successes. Ghostwire Tokyo, though, an action-adventure game with horror elements released in 2022, went on to exceed 6 million players, while Hi-Fi Rush, a rhythm-based action game released in January 2023, had reached 3 million players by August of the same year, winning a lot of awards as well. Even after Shinji Mikami's departure, the studio was well-equipped to continue without his guidance. The Evil Within was the last game directed by Mikami, who stepped back from his role to have future Tango games provide opportunities for other people. As for why he left Tango Gameworks, he comments on a desire to create an environment for young developers to gain experience and to distance himself from the survivor horror genre which he is frequently associated with. Despite being a studio created and groomed by Shinji Mikami, despite booming sale figures, public declarations of success, winning awards, and Hi-Fi Rush being hailed as a huge hit for Xbox by Microsoft no less, Tango Gameworks was still shut down. If you're wondering why, the answer may lie with Hero Dice. As I mentioned in the Redfall section, Zenimax and now Microsoft 2 were still looking for that game as a service that would bring in huge profits. Tango Gameworks, just like Arcane Austin, failed to produce such a game. You see, in March 2022, Tango Gameworks released the mobile gacha game Hero Dice as the next project following Ghostwire Tokyo. 
Hero Dice was a simple turn-based board game that involved multiplayer interaction. In the game, players use their hero characters to battle against each other, with dice rolls determining the hero's position and actions. Traveling within the game activates support attacks from allies, and the effectiveness of these supports depends on the number of allies involved. Additionally, players can use various cards that influence gameplay, offering abilities like consecutive attacks or escape from near death situations. These cards also allow for hero upgrades to gain advantages over enemies. Notably, Hero Dice supports up to 4 players in its multiplayer mode, emphasizing team strategy and coordination, and was available on iOS and Android devices. The game was shut down 5 months after release. To further add insult to injury, Matt Booty mentioned during a meeting for employees the day after the announcement of the closures that Xbox is seeking smaller games that give prestige and awards. That was something that raised a lot of eyebrows, especially since Microsoft had just shut down Tango Gameworks, known for producing such titles like Hi-Fi Rush. AlphaDog Games was a Canadian video game developer based in Nova Scotia that developed mobile games for the iOS and Android platforms. Nothing of note can be said about the studio except that their last game was Mighty Doom. Mighty Doom was a 2023 top-down mobile shooter game, it was part of the Doom franchise and focuses on playing the Slayer character to progress through various levels in a roguelite playstyle. The player comes across various challenges, such as monsters and environmental dangers. Compared to the mainline Doom games, the game follows a different visual approach as it features a more colorful and cartoonish design. Mighty Doom received mixed reviews according to Metacritic, based on a small sample of 6 reviews for its iOS version. IGN provided a mixed review, criticizing the game for its difficulty spikes, which seemed to be designed to incentivize in-game purchases, though it did commend the game for its cartoonish visuals and the incorporation of roguelite elements. PC Mag rated the game 60 out of 100, pointing out its average gameplay and lack of originality, and noted that it strays from the original Doom's style. However, the weapon and power-up pairings were highlighted as positive features. Alpha Dog Games was another studio that failed to develop a breakthrough live service game for Xbox Studios. Roundhouse Studio may be an unknown studio to you, but I mentioned them a while back as they assisted Arcane Austin in Redfall's development. Remember? Maybe you are familiar with Human Head Studios instead, the developers of the original Prey, which has no relation to Arcane Austin's Prey. They were also the developers of Rune and Rune 2, as well as the Dungeon Defenders 2 port for Xbox One and PlayStation 4, a free-to-play game with microtransactions that is still doing okay after its 2017 release. On November 13, 2019, the studio announced its closure immediately after the release of Rune 2, amidst the lawsuit from their publisher about abandoning further development of the game, immediately after the release. The whole team promptly formed a new studio, Roundhouse Studios, under Bethesda, owned by Zenimax Media. Dead. The email to staff sent by Matt Booty, head of Xbox Game Studios, announcing the closures, includes the following paragraph. Roundhouse Studio will be joining Zenimax Online Studios. Roundhouse has played a key role in many of our recent game launches and bringing them into ZOS to work on the Elder Scrolls Online will mean we can do even more to grow the world that millions of players call home. Roundhouse Studios team is the only team that gets saved twice from closure and layoffs by Zenimax. All these layoffs come shortly after the first wave of layoffs in February, which according to Microsoft's Phil Spencer, were already planned before the Activision Blizzard merger. This put Microsoft under scrutiny, since this move appears to contradict earlier assurances made by the tech giant regarding the independence of its newly acquired subsidiary, Activision Blizzard, according to statements by the US FTC. A move and subsequent statement that seems to mislead not only Microsoft's employees and customers, but also the FTC as well. Following the Bethesda Studios closures, Microsoft has already announced a third wave of layoffs and closures. All these layoffs are the result of the Xbox division's year-over-year growth, which was lower in the fiscal year of 2023, mainly due to the expensive acquisition of Activision Blizzard, poor hardware sales with the PlayStation 5 outselling Xbox 3 to 1, 
as well as the inability of Starfield and Forza Motorsport to bring in new Game Pass subscribers. Closing the Microsoft chapter, I would also like to remind you of the leaked Xbox roadmap documents which paint a picture of Microsoft's main focus being digital-only consoles and games as a service moving forward. Warner Bros. Discovery, traditionally focused on AAA console games, is planning a strategic shift under the guidance of J.B. Perret, the company's CEO and president of global streaming and games. Speaking at the Morgan Stanley Technology Media and Telecom Conference, Perret emphasized the potential of mixed reality and the metaverse as future platforms for growth. He highlighted the company's capability as both a developer and publisher, which he sees as a distinct advantage. Perret acknowledged the current reliance on four major franchises, Mortal Kombat, Game of Thrones, Harry Potter and the DC Universe, but noted the volatility this causes, exemplified by the disappointing release of Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League. To counter this instability, he proposed expanding into mobile and multi-platform free-to-play games, which are expected to launch later this year, and developing live service models for ongoing engagement, such as with Hogwarts Legacy. And then secondarily, live services. So rather than just launching uh, a one uh, kind of one and done uh, console game, how do we uh, develop a game around, for example, Hogwarts Legacy or Harry Potter that is a live service uh, where people can continue to live and work and build and, and uh, uh, play in that world on an ongoing basis. This new direction aims to provide more consistent revenue and reduce the highs and lows associated with blockbuster releases. While this gaming strategy is still in its early stages, compared to their efforts in revamping the streaming service max, Perret is optimistic about growth in the gaming sector between 2025 and 2027. The oxymoron of the above strategy is that it comes from the corporation that had the best-selling single-player game of 2023, Hogwarts Legacy, which is still selling well by the way, and the worst live service game of 2023, Suicide Squad Killer Justice League, which was a financial disaster. Hogwarts Legacy was so successful simply because it gave their player base what they expected and wanted from a Harry Potter game. At the same time, Suicide Squad Killer Justice League did the exact opposite. It disregarded what the player base of Rock City Studios expected and wanted, disrespecting the DC fans at the same time with the way Batman is depicted in the game's story. Instead, Rocksteady developed a game no one asked for with poor game design, forcing players towards microtransactions as reflected by the game's negative reviews. Even with all that, let's take a closer look at Perret's plan to create successful live service games. Whatever game they will release will be competing against the following titles. Honor of Kings, Candy Crush Saga, Roblox, Genshin Impact, Fortnite, Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn, Valorant, Path of Exile, Call of Duty Warzone, Rainbow Six Siege, Apex Legends, Sea of Thieves, Destiny 2, Overwatch, GTA Online, Halo Infinite, PUBG Mobile, League of Legends, Minecraft, and World of Warcraft. These are the top 20 most profitable live service games as of now, not of all time, in 2024 alone. Can you spot the obvious thing they all have in common? I will let you look at this list for a few seconds. There is not a single recent release on that list, except for Genshin Impact which was released during the COVID lockdowns way back in 2021. The rest are games released in the past 5-10 to years and long-standing IPs. The above list is just the top 20. The rest includes behemoths like Diablo, EA's FC, former FIFA, NBA 2K, Helldivers 2, Hearthstone, Warframe, World of Tanks, World of Ships, ESO, and the list goes on and on. There is a concept in business often discussed that if you are entering a market with an idea that everybody already knows, you are already too late. This speaks to the competitive disadvantage of entering a market without a unique differentiator. If Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is any indication of how they plan on approaching live service games, then I'm sorry to say that Warner Bros. Discovery doesn't seem to have the potential to create such a runaway success. Both gamers and developers know that it is hard to pull gamers away from a game they have already invested years into. They have created communities around them, friends, memories and acquired virtual properties. The failure of Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League proves that a strong brand name alone is not enough to sell games 
and maintain an active payer base to bring in the steady revenue per rate envisions. Live service games aren't something new. The classic old MMOs with a monthly subscription were the first live service games. We are talking about a business model that has been around for more than 30 years now. It has been done so many times in so many ways that most studios these days have to do some shady stuff to turn a profit. Diablo Immortal, EA's FC, former FIFA and NBA 2K being prime examples of the trend. This has caused a growing fatigue in the market with such predatory monetization tactics. Not to mention that the player's time and wallet is stretch enough as it is with the total titles available. Furthermore, JP Perret's strategy for Warner Bros. Discovery may be good for temporarily boosting stock prices, however, the reality remains that live service and VR games carry inherent risks greater than those of single-player AAA titles. For a more stable revenue stream, a successful live service game is crucial, a milestone Warner Bros. Discovery has yet to achieve, with no guarantees that it will succeed in the future. Despite having 2023's best-selling game and owning studios and IPs with proven track records, Warner Bros. Discovery is redirecting teams that specialize in specific game types to work on markedly different live service titles. This strategy mirrors the unsuccessful approach previously seen with ZeniMax and Xbox, likely leading to further layoffs and studio closures in the future, similar to the outcomes experienced by Sony. Sony's recent strategic shift towards live service games, despite evident market fatigue with such monetization tactics, coupled with their decision to release first-party exclusives on other platforms, casts doubt on their long-term viability. The company aims to launch multiple live service titles by 2026. However, this pivot has come at a significant cost. Extensive layoffs and restructuring have ensued, compromising the stability of their creative teams. Sony Interactive Entertainment cut 900 positions or about 8% of its global workforce at the start of this year. Sony is a consistently profitable market leader riding the success of the PlayStation 5 and the blockbuster lineup of its hits like The Last of Us, Spider-Man 2 and Helldivers 2. Regarding these layoffs, Sony president Hiroki Totoki explained in the company's recent financial earnings report that the PlayStation business is profitable, but not profitable enough, according to GameIndustry.biz. Let's look at Sony's projected profit margins for the game and network services division for the past four years. It was 12.9% in the fiscal year of 2020, 12.6% in the fiscal year of 2021, 6.9% in the fiscal year of 2022, and 5.8% in the fiscal year of 2023. Profit margins are indeed trending downwards and the post-COVID era may have played a role, but this is not the whole picture. Let's dive deeper and follow the money to see what is really going on. Since the beginning of 2021, Sony has acquired not one, not two, but a whopping 13 studios. Those were Housemark, Bluepoint, Nixis Software, Firesprite, Fabric Games, Valkyrie Entertainment, Firewalk Studios, Haven Studios, Savage Game Studios, Odez, iSize, the EVO Fighting Game Tournament, and last but not least, Bungie. That was a very aggressive move by Sony and is reflected in the fiscal years after 2021, but that is not all. Sony's CEO stated, Sony has committed the worst possible mistake in buying a studio and meddling to the point where it may end up in a death spiral and unable to complete any of the projects it is working on. That is true. Sony has changed studios after purchasing them in ways ranging from making a studio's culture worse, toxic, to personnel changes. They also made the same mistake that Xbox and Warner Bros. Discovery did, taking teams that specialized in one type of game and putting them to work on a very different live service game. Like forcing Naughty Dog to create a The Last of Us multiplayer live service spin-off which was fortunately cancelled before the studio was irrevocably damaged. Firesprite, a PSVR developer support studio, was reportedly working on a now cancelled Twisted Metal live service game. VR specialist PlayStation London Studio, which was shut down, was working on a live service online combat game. Then there is the crown jewel of acquisitions, Bungie, the studio that was supposed to turn Sony into a major live service operator overnight with a Destiny franchise. If you've been following Bungie since the first Destiny game, 
you would know that their in-house game engine has consistently caused problems for the development team. Not only that, their monetization scheme didn't sit well with their player base. As a result, the Destiny 2 annual revenues were running 45% behind its projections last October when the studio laid off about 100 people. Destiny 3 is years away and Marathon, Bungie's next upcoming live service game, won't arrive until late 2025, if not later. The result? Sony has already announced it will have no major first-party releases in 2024 and probably in 2025 as well, which isn't going to produce any good profit margins for the fiscal year of 2024, despite the rumored release of the PlayStation 5 Pro this holiday season, which faces challenges without new first-party games releases and the state of the global economy. Sony is not a studio like Rockstar or Larian, who can easily write a dry spell of a year or two without any new releases. Sony is a leading platform holder with a console in the midway point of this generation. This is the worst time to be without a new major first-party release and no live service hits to carry you through. Moreover, Sony has reportedly committed an astounding $2 billion to games research and development in fiscal year 2023, focusing on live service games and extended reality. Let that sink in for a moment. Last but not least, they have recently announced a reduction in the production of PSVR 2 units due to sales not meeting expectations, as well as making controversial moves like the censorship of Stellar Blade post-release and the exclusion of 180 countries from purchasing and playing Helldivers 2 and the upcoming Ghost of Tsushima PC release on Steam. In the first case, Sony allowed people to get excited about Stellar Blade, indicating that they were not going to censor the game at all, which in turn led to increased sales. Then, post-release, Sony either requested the censorship or were simply in agreement with it. While in the second case, Sony made the creation and linking of a PSN account mandatory in order to play Helldivers 2 post-launch. When the Helldivers 2 community revolted with the support of the developers and Valve delisting the game in 177 countries where PSN was not available and issuing refunds to players that had purchased the game, Sony reversed the decision. What the developers and gamers soon found out was that Sony had requested that Steam would not release Helldivers 2 in those 177 countries, which meant that players in those countries were still unable to purchase or play it. Not only that, Sony had notified Valve to exclude both games from three more countries, making the total number 180, even though Sony stated that PSN will not be a requirement in order to play those games, further alienating their player base. Extraction complete. Pelican 1 beginning ascent. Victory was never in doubt. Electronic Arts laid off approximately 5% of its workforce at the start of the year, affecting around 670 employees based on the current headcount of 13,400 as reported in its March 2023 annual report. These layoffs are part of a broader restructuring plan which includes office closures and the discontinuation of certain live service games such as MLB Top Sports and F1 Mobile Racing. In a memo to employees, EA CEO Andrew Wilson outlined a strategic pivot away from developing future licensed IPs that the company predicts will not succeed in the evolving gaming industry. GameIndustry.biz reports that this decision has already led to the cancellation of one such project, with its team being reassigned to other initiatives. Despite recent ventures into major external licenses with Disney including Star Wars and Marvel for the upcoming Black Panther and Iron Man games, which are still in development, Wilson emphasized a new focus on fostering creativity and accelerating innovation within owned IPs, sports titles, and large online communities. Addressing the layoffs, Wilson conveyed that all potential alternatives were thoroughly considered to minimize impact, stating that the process of notifying affected individuals would be largely completed during this quarter. If you were ever wondering how much layoffs and studio closures are costing a corporation, here is an interesting breakdown. The restructuring is expected to cost EA between $125 million and $165 billion, as detailed in an SEC filing. This includes up to $65 million in charges related to office space reductions and 
$40 million to $55 million for employee severance and related costs. Additional expenses of $35 million to $45 million are anticipated for costs associated with licensor commitments. This restructuring marks the second major downsizing at Electronic Arts in two years, following last March's announcement of a 6% staff reduction equating to about 775 positions based on the prior year's global employee count. Moreover, CFO Stuart Canfield remarked that life service net earning decreased by 2% year-on-year to $5.23 billion. Canfield also noted that EA Sports FC and Apex Legends are expected to continue to face difficult comparable periods in 2025. Despite these challenges, Canfield acknowledged that trends from the previous financial year persisted and highlighted the hugely successful rebrand of VA Sports FC along with franchises such as Madden, which drove a 59% increase in net income year over year to $1.27 billion for Electronic Arts. At the time of announcement, one could easily assume that failing live service games and IPs are to blame for this restructuring, but just a few days ago, the following statement was made by Electronic Arts CEO Andrew Wilson. Based on our early assessment, we believe that more than 50% of our development processes will be positively impacted by the advances in generative AI. EA, however, had previously stated it would restrict the use of a generative AI to the ideation phase of game development. Last, but certainly not least, Electronic Arts CEO Andrew Wilson recently made a statement about his intention to put ads in video games. One notable incident that happened last year involving Electronic Arts was the release of Immortals of Aveum, a game that significantly exceeded its budget due to an aggressive marketing campaign and poor oversight of Ascendant Studios. The game's ambitions were way beyond the studio's capabilities, leading to a disastrous release marked by technical issues. These issues led to poor reviews and sales. Immortals of Aveum, Ascendant Studios' first game, was developed using the Unreal Engine 5 and had a development cost of about $85 million, with an additional $40 million spent on marketing and distribution by Electronic Arts. In September 2023, a month after release, Ascendant CEO Brett Robbins announced the layoff of approximately 40 developers, about 45% of the studio's workforce, due to the game's poor sales. By April 2024, the remaining staff of about 30 was furloughed. In a post-mortem analysis, EA attributed the failure of Immortals of Aveum to the inherent risk of AAA single-player games development and to diminishing player interest in such games. A narrative that Hogwarts Legacy, Starfield, Armored Core 6 and many other sales of AAA games released in 2023 disprove. Ascendant Studios, on the other hand, pointed to the game's late August 2023 release sandwiched between Armored Core 6 and Starfield as detrimental to its financial performance as well as the scope of the game being beyond the studio's capabilities. Both parties overlooked the significant technical problems that were a major factor in its lackluster sales. The argument that competing games precluded its success is questionable given the fact that Starfield experienced significant pre-order success, quickly becoming the top-selling game on Steam within a day of its pre-orders going live according to Xputer.com. The same is true for Armor Court 6, according to TwistedVoxel.com. Pre-orders for both games went live months before Immortals of Aveum's release. Starfield was also available on Game Pass, which means a lot of people didn't even purchase the game around Immortals of Aveum's release. Furthermore, Immortals of Aveum was accessible on EA subscription service for just $16.99 on launch day, which further hampered the game's revenue. The game also didn't have impressive wishlists or pre-order numbers according to SteamDB, which should have been an indication about the game's reception. As a result, Immortals of Aveum peaked at just under 800 Steam players shortly after launch. At the same time, and within the first week after launch, Chilquarium, an unknown indie game by a solo developer, had about 5,000 purchases and activations on Steam. That game launched the same day as Starfield and achieved success with a non-existent marketing budget demonstrating that well-made games can thrive even amidst formidable competition. Despite its aesthetic appeal, Immortals of Aveum's failure reflects a troubling scenario where Electronic Arts seems willing to let the game fail without addressing its inherent issues.
in every layoff, studio shutdown and poor financial report story involving the industry's top corporations, you'll find failed live service games, stagnating subscription services and misleading announcements at the core. Instead, we are being led to believe that the development of AAA games is to blame, with live service games being the less risky way forward. At the same time, Larian Studios' Baldur's Gate 3 success challenges the industry's prevailing narratives. Today's examination reveals a troubling pattern within the gaming industry. CEOs and executives, having presented flawed strategies, scrambled to balance the books ahead of the 2024 financial year reports with layoffs and studio closures. Parent studios are pushing their teams to take risks while falsely reassuring them that everything will be fine. Corporations undertake restructuring to mitigate risks, all the while attempting to develop a successful live service game, a highly risky endeavor. Despite these changes, they assure developers that these decisions do not reflect of the creativity and skills of the talented individuals in these themes while replacing developers with Gen AI. Then, they claim that making these tough decisions allows them to increase investment in other portfolio areas and focus on priority games and new IPs, despite following a strategy that is both unsustainable and morally questionable. I can't help but fear for the future of studios like Ninja Theory, Obsidian, Bioware and many other beloved studios, who aren't equipped to create live service games and may be viewed as obsolete by their parent companies once their games are released, which speaks volumes about the morality of the gaming industry in its current state. One thing we need to understand is that the industry leaders, with the exception of Nintendo, are not video game companies anymore. The above corporations are but the tip of the iceberg. There are many more to examine. Let me know whether these types of videos resonate with you. And in the meantime, don't forget to comment your thoughts below, like if you agree with this take, and subscribe for more deep dives into the gaming world. Resources used in this deep dive will be linked in the video description. Until next time, stay safe. But with that way out, they're probably expecting you, so you had me at way out. Let's go.